Well, all year we're focusing on the greatness of God, and today we get to start a brand new sermon series, which is always something that's fun for a preacher, a brand new sermon series called When God is Big. And the big idea of this sermon series is this, way too many Christians have way too small of a view of who God is. And when God is small, now, please hear me, not in reality, but in our hearts, in our minds, in our imaginations, when God is small to you, it has a direct impact on your life. Other things become big. Other things get the size of God in your mind, heart, and imagination. Like what? Well, other things like your circumstances become big. Other things like your emotions, how you're feeling become really big. Other things like sometimes your failures or your struggles or your sin become all-consuming. And this is not good. This is not helpful. This is not the way that God created or intended your life, your life to be. Well, what happens when God is big? What happens when you have a better or truer or bigger vision of who God is? Well, it changes everything. And in this series, we're just going to consider seven of the ways that life changes when God is big. We're going to start by considering what changes in life through the lens of our four core values as a church, through the lens of worship, community, ministry, and mission. These things change with a bigger vision of who God is. But then after that, we're just going to consider three of the changes in life that we experience, addressing a few of the main issues that people in and outside the church face today, struggle with today, including the issues of fear and personal identity and addiction. Now, when God is big, it has a huge impact on how we live out our values and how we deal with our issues and our struggles. Well, today we're going to start by seeing how the greatness of God changes our experience and our priority for worship. And my goal today really is this, is that when you see that God is big, when God is big, worship is obvious. Worship is obvious. Well, if you have a Bible, please open your Bible or Bible app to Revelation chapter 4, starting in verse 1. Revelation? Yes, Revelation. We're going there today. And we'll have the text up on the screens as well. We have a lot of of Bible to cover this morning. Uh, It's a longer passage. So what we're going to do is, instead of reading all the way through it and then going back through it, we're just going to unpack it as we go here. So Revelation chapter 4, starting in verse 1. After this, I looked, and there before me was a door standing open in heaven. And the voice I had first heard speaking to me like a trumpet said, Come up here, and I will show you what what must take place after this. At once, I was in the Spirit, and there before me was a throne in heaven with someone sitting on it. And the one who sat there had the appearance of jasper and ruby, a rainbow that shone like an emerald encircled the throne. Surrounding the throne were 24 other thrones, and seated on them were 24 elders. They were dressed in white and had crowns of gold on their heads. From the throne came flashes of lightning, rumblings, and peals of thunder. In front of the throne, seven lamps were blazing, and and these are the seven spirits of God. Also in front of the throne, there was what looked like a sea of glass, clear as crystal. This is God's word. Let's pause here for a second. So Revelation is fascinating. It's one of the most fascinating books in the Bible. And some Christians, to be honest, are obsessed with it. They try and read it and look for clues of when things are going to happen, where, and so forth in terms of the return of Christ. Other Christians avoid it for the same reason. Uh, Now, (laughs) one of the reasons I think it's hard for us to understand the book of Revelation is that it's uh, similar to other ancient works of Jewish apocalyptic literature. Now, if you go on Netflix, you're not going to find a category of movies or TV shows of apocalyptic literature. Maybe the only thing that we have close close to that would be like zombie movies or something like that, like post-apocalyptic is somewhat similar, uh, but not exactly it. Well, 
the book of Revelation is full of these otherworldly images and beasts and symbols, and it's difficult to know what needs to be taken literally, what needs to be taken figuratively, or some combination of both. And so my goal here today is not to give you a comprehensive official guide as far as all the symbolism that we see in this passage. It's just to try and be clear in the parts that are clear and to tread carefully when the path isn't quite as clear. Deal? Okay. Well, with that, let's uh, consider this first passage that we read together. First, I just want you to imagine. Imagine if you were walking in the woods and you came upon a door and it opened into heaven. What do you think you would see? Not the heaven of TV and movies and things like that, but the actual reality of God's space. Of, of, of the spiritual realm outside of space-time, the throne room of heaven. Do you, do you get this image starting to form in your mind? Well, John says that the first thing that he noticed, and this is important, was not what he saw, but who he heard. The first thing that John noticed, he says, is the voice, a voice like a trumpet, it was the first voice that he had heard. And earlier in the book of Revelation, he says that it was this risen Jesus Christ. The first thing that John notices about heaven is the voice of Jesus. Then John says that he was in the spirit. And I do this because I envision him swept up in the Holy Spirit. Now, what does that mean? Well, every Christian is, is filled, indwelled, with the Holy Spirit. So he's not saying that he became a Christian here. The apostle was definitely a Christian before this time. This is at the end of his long life. He's describing a spiritual vision or being caught up in the Spirit, similar to visions that several Old Testament prophets experienced as well. I think of prophets like Isaiah and Jeremiah and Ezekiel and Daniel. In fact, this whole passage seems to reference or maybe echo aspects of those older heavenly visions. So John, caught up in the spirit, sees a throne in heaven and someone sitting on it. There's a king in heaven. Well, what does this king look like? <laughs> That's a great question. John tries to answer that question. What's the most beautiful, most expensive, most dazzlingly beautiful thing that you could imagine? Well, the king looked like that. That's what John is trying to communicate in using the descriptions of, of jewels and rainbows. He's, he's grasping at language to try and describe this heavenly reality. He's stretching these earthly words to try and fit the bounds of heaven and the radiant glory of his vision. And the heavenly king is surrounded by 24 elders who together with the thunder and the lightning and the lamps and the spirits and the sea of glass, all are communicating to us that the throne room of heaven is a most impressive place. Verse 6. Revelation 4, verse 6. In the center, around the throne, were four living creatures. You're going to love this part. And they were covered with eyes in front and in back. The first living creature was like a lion. The second was like an ox. The third had a face like a man. And the fourth was like a flying eagle. Each of the four living creatures had six wings and was covered with eyes all around, even under its wings. Day and night, they never stopped saying, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. Whenever the living creatures gave glory, honor, and thanks to him who sits on the throne and who lives forever and ever, the 24 elders fall down before him who sits on the throne and worship him who lives forever and ever. They lay their crowns before the throne and say, you are worthy, our Lord and God, to receive glory and honor and power. Why? For you created all things, 
and by your will they were created and have their being. Let's pause here for a moment. So now, to add to this vision, we have four living beings, living creatures, living things that look like nothing we have ever seen. Amen? Well, these creatures are very similar to the cherubim and the seraphim or the angelic creatures that are present in the throne room visions from the other prophets. If you go back this week and you read through Ezekiel 1 or Isaiah chapter 6, uh, some of these encounters or with God or what are called theophanies, there's all sorts of fantastic imagery that, that appears. So this isn't just some fever dream. We're meant to see a continuity here between Old Testament visions of the throne room of God and New Testament visions of the throne room of God. This isn't just an overactive imagination. This isn't John going artist on us. This is John seeing, like the other prophets, a vision of this spiritual reality. The four living creatures, whatever they're meant to represent, all living beings, all of the spiritual realm, either way they are saying, holy, 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 is the Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. They're worship leaders. They're lifting up true statements about the God who created the heavens and the earth. And what happens? Well, all of the other created beings follow suit. The elders around the throne of God fall down before the throne and worship God as well. They cast down their crowns before the throne, saying what? You are worthy, our Lord and God, to receive glory and honor and power for why? For you created all things, and by your will they were created and have their being. So the content of their worship, the content of the worship in the throne room of God starts, it's rooted in God's work as the creator of all things. And this brings me to my first point. Number one, if God has created us, then he deserves our lives. If God is the creator, if, if he is the maker of heaven and earth, if he is the one who formed the stars, if he is the one who thought of things like space and time and gravity and particles and people, if God is the one who is the author and the source of all life in heaven and on earth, including your own, then all of us, every single one of us, owe God everything because none of us would be here. In fact, nothing would be here without his divinely creative power and will. So the 24 elders have thrones and, and they have golden crowns and this implies a measure of authority and honor. But what happens when they worship the Lord? They get down off their thrones. They humble themselves. They bow before their God and they cast their crowns down before their maker. Why? Why? Well, because if God has created us, then he deserves our lives. Even the best of our lives, which is what I think the crowns represent. So according to the Bible, the whole of reality is founded on the first verse of the Bible. The opening verse is this. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Everything else in our whole cosmos flows out of this. However, the fact that God is the creator of all things isn't by itself good news. After all, what, what if this creator God was a tyrant? What if he was evil? What if God created us just to play with us or to use us or to abuse us in some way? If God has created us, then he deserves our lives, whether or not he is good. We would still owe him everything 
And I believe that we'd still owe him our allegiance, our obedience, and our worship as well. But the Christian claim is that God is more than just a creator. He is also the Savior. The claim is that God is great, but God is also good, as we've already seen in, in our series in the Psalms so far. So let's continue with chapter 5, and we'll see this theme, this secondary theme develop as well. Chapter 5, verse 1. Then I saw in the right hand of him who sat on the throne a scroll with writing on both sides and sealed with seven seals. And I saw a mighty angel proclaim in, proclaiming in a loud voice, who is worthy to break the seals and open the scroll? But no one in heaven or on earth or under the earth could open the scroll or even look inside it. I wept and wept because no one was found who was worthy to open the scroll or look inside. Then one of the elders said to me, do not weep. See, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has triumphed. He is able to open the scroll in its seven seals. Then I saw a lamb looking as it had been slain, standing at the center of the throne encircled by the, tw- the four living creatures and the elders. The lamb had seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God, or the sevenfold spirit of God, sent out into all the earth. He went and took the scroll from the right hand of him who sat on the throne. And when he had taken it, the four living creatures and the 24 elders fell down before the lamb. Each one had a harp, and they were holding golden bowls full of incense, which are the prayers of God's people. And they sang a new song, saying, You are worthy to take the scroll and to open its seals, because you were slain. And with your blood, you purchased for God persons from every tribe and language and people and nation. You have made them to be a kingdom and priests to serve our God, and they will reign on the earth. Let's pause here. So here in this scene, in Revelation 5, we have an initial problem, which is a big problem. And the problem is is that this scroll with writing on both sides is not able to be opened. Now, what is this scroll? Well, this scroll is either the book of life, which is mentioned later in Revelation, which is the record of those who have been saved by the redemptive work of the Lamb, or this scroll is a scroll of judgment. It's possible that John is seeing the same scroll that was given to Ezekiel, In Ezekiel's vision, he is given a scroll with writing on both sides that is a book of judgment and mourning and woe. A record, basically, of everything that's wrong with the world, including everything that we have done as well. Now, the initial problem is that there is no one who is found to be worthy to open it. No human being can touch this scroll. And John weeps and weeps because a creation that is broken by sin and death without a savior isn't just disappointing. It's devastating. It's hopeless. It's judgment and condemnation alone, period. Now, many people today are ambivalent about God. They're they're casually agnostic. I think only because they haven't fully thought out the implications of their position and the hopelessness of it. If there is no lamb, meaning is if there is no sacrifice to atone or pay for our sin, if there is no savior, then life is worse than meaningless. It's suffering with no point. We too ought to weep and weep And some do who think through this position. But wait, John, don't lose hope now. One of the elders tells John there is hope. He points to one who is called the Lion of Judah. 
the root of David, and the lamb who was slain. Now, all of these titles, all of these descriptions aren't meant to be taken literally, obviously. There isn't actually a lion who is also a lamb that was slain. This is, of course, Jesus. But is Jesus literally a lion, root, or lamb? (laughs) The root image there is the least inspiring, awe-inspiring. No, Jesus is a man. But this symbolic language helps us to understand more about who Jesus is and what he has accomplished for us. Well, we have to ask the question, how then was Jesus the conquering lion of Judah? Well, he had victory because he was a lamb who was slain. The sacrificial lamb, the the Passover lamb. Because of the death of Jesus on the cross for the sins of the world, he was found to be worthy to open the scroll. He was found to be worthy to do what? To purchase or to redeem people for God from every tribe, language, people, and nation. So first, if God has created us, then he deserves our lives. He deserves our worship. He deserves even the best of our lives. That's just logical. But second, but if God has saved us, then he deserves our love. Not just our begrudging allegiance. Not just our delayed obedience when it is required. Why? Because God isn't evil. God doesn't delight in the death or the condemnation of the wicked. In John's vision, and in the gospel, of course, we see God's heart to rescue and redeem the lost and the last and the least among us. We see the willingness of Jesus to step out of the throne room of heaven, step out of the glory, honor, and praise that he deserved from from eternity past to step out of the comfort of heaven and down into the darkness of this earth. We see the willingness of Jesus to serve and to teach and to live with, to bear with, to forgive and to love his disciples. Imperfect men and women, just like you and I. We see his heart in calling them to not just be his servants and his followers, but to be his friends and ultimately his brothers and sisters in the family of God. We see the desire of Jesus that we would share in the depth of the love and the relationship that he had experienced from all time past with his Father in, in heaven. This is Jesus, the lamb that was slain. This is the one who is worthy of all of our glory, honor, and praise. This is the one who took our place and bore our sin upon the cross. Why? so that we might be set free from the power of sin and death and hell forever and ever. The one who rose again on the third day, victorious, risen, alive, and reigning as the king of heaven. If God has created us, then he deserves our lives, even the best of our lives, whether we want to worship him or not. But if God has saved us, through the person and work of Jesus, if he offers us this salvation by grace alone through faith in the person and work of Jesus, then we don't have to weep any longer. In fact, I think that he has earned our love. And one day Jesus will wipe every tear from our eyes. Revelation 5 ends with the whole of creation, every living creature, in heaven and on earth, singing in praise and worship of the God of creation and salvation. This is the song of heaven. And to the degree that we, that we echo these songs here and now are the degree that we can echo this song of heaven. Well, the big idea today is this. When God is big, worship is obvious. We can do no no other thing. 
John had this vision. He found a door that opened into the throne room of heaven. And what he saw inside, as crazy as the imagery is, was a vision of how life should be here and now for us. Because when you see God for who he is, especially in the person and work of Jesus, from creation to salvation and on into the new creation in the future, as you read through the Bible or as you hear a sermon about this or as you just remember and contemplate who God is, he becomes very big. There is one throne at the center of the throne room of heaven We are not on it. He is, and he is everything. Now, when you realize that not only do we owe him everything, but he deserves the primary place in our hearts, in our affections, the place above all else. And when you realize this, when God takes that place in our hearts, our minds, our imaginations, then worship becomes obvious. It becomes the natural overflow of the words of our mouths. But let's think for a moment what happens when God is small. Again, not in reality. John had a vision of reality. But sometimes in in our experience, in our day-to-day lives, our perception, our vision of God becomes disjointed with reality. And when God becomes small, then worship becomes optional, totally optional. If it works for you, great. If not, no big deal. You only participate in worship if it kind of fits, if it fits your preferences or if it fits your schedule. If we do the songs you like, you'll be there. If the preaching is all right, you'll keep coming back. If you aren't busy this weekend, you plan to come. But when God is big, worship becomes obvious, not optional. It supersedes your preferences. I like the songs that we do, but I've been at churches where I do not like the songs that they do, and I can still worship. I can still focus on the one that we are directing our songs to. When God is big, it reprioritizes our schedules as well. Why? Because Jesus has been found worthy to be praised. He has formed us, and he has redeemed us, and he is transforming us by the power of his spirit. Now, I know that sometimes people get sick, and I know sometimes people go on vacation, Or sometimes life just conspires against our ability to gather in worship together. But when God is big, worship is obvious. It's just a natural outflow of our heart, and we would long to be together in worship, even if we can't be. Worship becomes simply the natural overflow of a heart that sees and celebrates the beauty and glory of Christ. He is the lamb who was slain. He is the only one who is worthy of our worship. Let us pray. Our Father in heaven, thank you for this strange vision that John shared with us today. Thank you, Lord, for drawing us up in some way by the power of your spirit into your throne room so that we might get just a tiny, imperfect glimpse of who you are and that you are worthy of our praise. Father, you are worthy of our praise because you are the creator, the author, the maker of heaven and earth. We thank you. We give you the glory, honor, and praise that you deserve as our creator. And Lord Jesus, you are the lamb who was slain. You are the rescuer. You are the redeemer. You are our savior. You are the one, the only one who is worthy to open the scroll, the book of life, and purchase for yourself men and women from every people 
from every nation and tribe, tongue, and language that this world has seen. We give you the honor, glory, praise. We give you the thanks for being our Savior. Father, would you forgive us when we take our eyes off of you? When, forgive us, Lord, at times when worship becomes all too optional for us. Kindle the flames yet again of your spirit in our hearts to burn brightly in praise and glory and honor to you forever and ever. We pray in Jesus' name, amen.